Well, maybe just even a, a, just to get going, one of the things I love about your life, probably more than anything else, is one is your absolute love for the word of God. And then two, your overwhelming love for Jesus. And I just thought it'd be kind of fun for those who are listening. Could you describe what does it mean to actually have intimacy with Jesus? Or what does that look like? How do we have intimacy with Jesus practically? Well, uh, all of theology uh, is in, in, in the Bible is relational. All biblical theology is a relational uh, approach. It's never, it's never a substance, a thing. You don't go to Dollar General and buy it. Forgiveness is a relational thing. Reconciliation is a relational thing. Uh, I don't reach in my pocket, grab a hold of forgiveness, hand it to you, and, and then that's done. It's, not, it's never just an experience. But then life is like that. Marriage is not a ceremony. Marriage is a relational experience between two people that, yes, has a moment in time, uh, an experience, a ceremony, but it unfolds. So when you realize that Jesus is this real live living person who has a mind, emotion, and will, which is the personality, and hey, God may again may be more than personality. He can be anything he wants to be. But as we see him in the scriptures, he is this living functioning person. And to know him and become intimate with him and embrace him and be embraced by him becomes a Christian experience. And that was the radical change that took place in my life as a teenager. I moved from just going to an altar to living with this person. And of course, that back in those days, uh, we called it saturation. And that was a, that was a good term because I, I vowed to saturate in his person, which, be, which was to, to develop a God awareness. And then of course, later, uh, God brought this book, Practicing His Presence, Brother Lawrence, and I thought I invented this thing, you know. <laughs> Here, this guy back in the 1600s had it. Uh, so, uh, and living in his person and becoming intimate with him and saturating in, in his presence and being aware of him became vital. But then the scriptures got involved in it, which then developed into saturation into the scriptures. And I have, I have seen over the years in my own personal experience, a, um, what would you say, an, an evolving in language, which bes uh, bespeaks the evolving of the concept. In other words, intimacy with Jesus, when I was just saturating in his presence, moved to uh, sourcing, the sourcing idea became very valid, where, hey, I didn't, I didn't want to just feel his presence. I wanted to be sourced by his energy and sourced by his power so that nothing I did would come out of self or I wanted his heart. I wanted to think like he thought, like he thinks and feel like he think, feels and so forth. Uh, so sourcing became, and now of course the latest is this, this merger concept, which is uh, in, was a realization out of the Sermon on the Mount a realization of the of the depth of this, and I have discovered uh, I've been getting into this idea of the imagery of the scriptures. See, the Jesus constantly and used imagery uh, to describe this relationship. Uh, for instance, the vine and the branch. Well, I'm not a branch. I'm, I'm obviously, but it's imagery trying to describe something you can't describe and trying to describe the, the relational intimacy that it goes on between me and him as he flows his life in me. I bear the fruit of his life. I begin to live in his flow. Have, I, I, I look like him. I begin to have the bark of the vine and that's all imagery. But then when you begin to think about father and son, I'm a child of God and Hey, nobody's knocking that, but I believe that that's imagery. Uh, the imagery of that is trying to describe something that can't be described because there's, there's holes in that. Well, if, if he's my father and I'm his son, who's my mother? Well, there isn't a mother. <laughs> well, because it's imagery. And could it be that the intimacy he wants to have with me is far beyond uh, even the father-son relationship? And of course, the bride and bridegroom, which of course really 
uh, deflates my masculinity, but I'm a bride of Christ. What that's imagery trying to describe this, this phenomenal intimacy of relationship. So I don't think we've even begun to scratch the surface on what it is to be intimate with Jesus. Uh, and I think he's pulling us into that uh, mm -hmm. more and more and more until that becomes the reality of our life. That's so beautiful. By the way, I don't think anyone can deflate your masculinity with a name like Manly. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, it was really fun. I loved listening to you this last Sunday, uh, which was fun to see you get to see you. But one of the things you said is, is something I keep hearing you say, and, you, and I've heard you say it now. I think I first heard you back in the late nineties or mid nineties, uh, which is a crazy thought. Uh, and I heard, I heard you say back then uh, when I traveled with you in 05, it, it was a thrust of what you were saying that whole summer, at least in my life. But one of the things you, you said, even this past Sunday is the fact that this intimacy idea that you have with Jesus uh, does not wane. It does, does not grow mediocre. In fact, it just enhances and increases, just gets better and better and better to the point where uh, your statement, which I love when you make it, is just give me five or 10 more years and just see where I'm at with Jesus. Uh, could you even just flesh that out just one degree? Like, what does that mean for you personally uh, of knowing that this relational reality with Christ just gets better? Well, uh, there's no there's no way to describe uh the you are where you are uh age wise and uh, experience wise and hey i would i'm a young man then i'm a middle-aged man then i'm an old man and perspective changes uh, and everything in my life <clears throat> has become less significant i used to go to a church and pastor would say oh let me show you the sanctuary and I'd say, wow, this is something. Now I say, well, I've seen them. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not impressed because you've gotten, I've seen so many sanctuaries and I'm so used to it that so the more you get used to something, the more you handle it, the more mundane it comes, the more commonplace it becomes. Uh, so, and, and some for some people, I think uh, Christianity has become that. You, you, the Good Friday, you know, we cross ourselves and yeah, Jesus died for me, and we know the Christmas carols, and so we go through this, but this intimacy idea uh, is, uh, again, I don't think we've scratched the surface on it, and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's the only thing in my life that's ever gotten bigger and bigger. Uh, the whole thing is just just the depth of this, and and as, as the older I get, the more I'm looking into what's eternity going to be like, and what uh where is he going with this thing if this is an eternal deal where is this all headed uh it certainly isn't headed to playing a harp uh, or, or or eternal shuffleboard i mean this is way beyond uh the significance of of your life who you are the destiny of your being and and all that he has planned see that's not something to mess with so it goes way beyond and I, and I suppose when I was 30, I thought in terms of this life and ministry and evangelism and wow. But uh, hey, you begin to think in terms of forever, where, where is this really going? And, it, and it's phenomenal. Mm, that's beautiful. Uh, I, I love, it, correct me if I'm wrong, you became a pastor at age 17, right? Was that your first church at 17? That is true. Yeah, that is uh, true. And then you spent, I think, seven years or so. And then at 25, felt a f called a full-time evangelism and did that for 40 years. And, and then over the last little bit, uh, you've been doing evangelism in the school and, and the church and all that kind of stuff. So you, you've had 60 years of preaching, teaching, and all that, that kind of stuff. With all that perspective, what is there anything that you would actually go back and tell yourself as a, as a teenager or as a young adult getting going? Uh, like, especially in this light of the intimacy idea, like as you as you look back at 60 years of ministry and just all that God's been doing in your life, uh, is there anything that you would probably encourage or correct yourself with of where you were at? Wow. Um, one, of the, one of the, I don't know that this is a correction, but one of the things that I've been deeply, deeply aware of which, which all goes back to this expansion idea, I guess, interesting, uh, is that, uh, for instance, I, I, uh, 
we started with teen camps, you know, back in the day. Okay, I'm going into evangelism and, oh, you got long hair, you'd probably be good with teens. So I'm into teen camps. And of course, the philosophy of teen camps was keep them up all night so they don't get into trouble and wear them out. And then they bring them to chapel at nine o'clock in the morning and say, hey, you handle them, manly. <laughs> well, you, you, uh, the preaching scene at that point while they're trying to sleep is not, is not communicating. So we did that in that day, we developed what we called raps, which is raps aren't raps anymore, but it was to try to engage discussion, have them have their Bible and, and, and ask them questions and make them answer and make fun of them in the meantime. So uh, we developed these raps on being, these discussions being, and, and the teen camps were uh, buzz into the being, have a honey of a time. Man, that was back in the in the in the late '60s, brother, or the, or the yeah, the late '60s, early '70s that that I got into that. So we we took a Bible passage and the being, and we did all week on the being. Well, uh, now we're still talking about being, but my uh, what do I, how do I want to say it? My my involvement or my understanding now. It isn't that what I knew then was wrong, but wow, I didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> I mean, the concept was there, but the concept was so big, much bigger than what I recognized. And I'm, I'm seeing that, at, that that's, a, that's an interesting perspective that it wasn't that anything I preached was wrong or what I said was wrong or even what I did was wrong, but I'm seeing that I didn't, I wish I had had now, I wish I'd had then what I have now in the wonder of his presence. But hey, that's impossible. And I know that's all a part of growth and maturing. And uh, so finding the, and the thing that was so, is so if I would encourage anybody who's going into ministry or is in ministry, I, the thing that kept us straight through all of that was this book and this living word and the written word and the interaction of those two things coming together that gave us truth that was conceptually valid. And yet I didn't know the fullness of it because it, again, it's like an onion and we've used that illustration a lot. You peel it, it has layers and you peel it. I love that. <clears throat> so beautiful. Uh, I was pondering this morning, or maybe it was last night, uh, you have been preaching the book of Matthew now almost for 40 years, because I think you said you started in 1982, uh, which oh, is the year I was born, yeah. interestingly. Yeah. Uh, I think that's why it's stuck in my head. <laughs> uh, so you're, you're almost, you've almost been 40 years in the book wow. of Matthew. Uh, I love the book of Matthew, and I know that I'd probably argue it's probably one of your favorite books maybe just because you stay in it all the time, or maybe it's just a misconception that I have of you uh, that you just absolutely love the book of Matthew. But has there been any, anything while you've been studying, whether it's Matthew or Acts or whatever you've, whatever you looked at that really came to you, uh, came across as a surprise that just God overwhelmed you, uh, just completely took you by surprise, radically changed, like any like grand aha moments that you just weren't expecting? Oh, yes. Uh, and my wife could give you some insight into that. I, I, I began in chapter eight uh, after the Sermon on the Mount because I didn't want to get involved in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, so I started studying the book of Matthew uh, in chapter eight and, and worked through nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and then came to chapter 16, uh, which is where the whole cross style language showed up in that passage because Jesus was calling his disciples to a style he was talking to them about death and he said I want you to come and join me in this style he wasn't inviting them to take to die with him on the cross so there'd be 12 crosses what uh, 13 crosses he wasn't inviting them for that it was a style so that that cross style idea obviously became so forceful that it uh, and out of that cross style, chapter 16, he introduces it and it flows through the rest of the book. But by the time I came to chapter 18, 
Uh, my wife says I started yelling louder. Uh, I became uh, more intense uh, because 18 is, is a strong chapter where his disciples are so full of themselves that they're arguing about who's going to have the right hand and the left, or not, not the right hand left, who's going to be number one in the kingdom, uh, who's going to have the top spot. And then it goes into chapter 20 where they uh, two brothers argue about right hand and left hand. But the whole idea of self-centeredness in light of the cross style became so vivid and forceful that I just, it just, there, there was a definite shift in gears over those chapters. Hmm. And, it, and it happened about, it, it wasn't the chapters or the stories, it was the concept of the, of the, of the style of the cross where it was going to take the way we were going to win the world, Jesus says. It's not by programs, not by hot shot uh, deals, performances. It was going to be one because we bleed, suffer, and die. And you embrace your neighbor in death. Uh, now I've gone back, of course, to the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is filled with it. I mean, oh, brother. Filled with that same stuff. That, uh, <clears throat> that truth that you're talking about, I think, is what one drew me to you just, I, I think when I first heard you speak, it, it was the first time the word of God actually became alive. And there was, I'd, I'd heard preaching all my life, but when you came to town and we were preaching at my church, I, I was so captivated, not even just by your communication style, which is really anointed and profound, but your grasp uh, of the word of God. I, I know you don't like people talking all this stuff about you, but uh, but just that grabbing a hold of that concept and then proclaiming it uh, was so gripping. It, it was the power of the word. In other words, it was just the anointing of the word, let alone the messenger. But it was just you talking about that bleed, suffer, and die uh, was so radical in my life because I think I grew up in a, in a culture of Christianity that was all about what I can do for myself or what I can do for God. What um, you know, it, it's it's all it's a it's a it's a self centeredness which strangely, I was talking to Sean and Lori this, this last week, uh, when you're looking at a lot of the movements of today's Christianity, it actually seems like it's a, it's a me centered version of Christianity. A lot, a lot of the songs we sing is me centered. A lot of the theology out there is all about uh, me and my position and what I can do. And, uh, rather than letting it be Jesus focused. And I think your declaration of that cross style concept to the point where even you named the ministry cross style ministries, uh, has been just a radical thing. And I think it's something that God has brought me back to uh, over and over and over again in my life, uh, just realizing that the only way I can move forward is for me to die, for me to take the lowest place. And as you say, bleed, suffer, and die. Could you talk really quickly just about that idea of cross style? In other words, you you often talk about the fact that, yeah, the cross is important. Obviously, it's it's essential to the life of Christ, but it wasn't just a mere moment in time could you like flesh out this idea of what it, what does it mean for it to be actual a lifestyle? Yeah. Well, again, we, we, we look at Christianity, like going to the dentist, you know, you got to go to the altar, you got to embarrass yourself, admit you were wrong and get that thing over with, like going to the dentist and getting your tooth drilled. And then you wipe the saliva off your chin and onto the bigger and better, which is obviously T-bone steaks and, and heaven and, and all the blessings. Uh, so I got that behind me, uh, and, and, I, and I have issues with uh, uh, some of our, even our hymns, and man, it's bad to talk about the hymns, wow. but you know, the old rugged cross, the, the whole chorus of the old rugged cross says, I will exchange it for a crown, so hey, the cross is going to be eliminated, it's going to be set aside for the glory and the wonder but I don't, I don't buy that. I think the cross is going to be at the heart. Hey, Jesus in the book of the Revelation is proclaimed to us as the lamb, which is all the symbol of the cross stuff and the, and the sacrificial giving. And that the heart of the kingdom in the, in the, in the, in the heavenlies is wrapped up in this, in this cross thing, in this bleed, suffer, and die. Give your life away. Never think about yourself. But it was, that's such a radical concept. I, I was afraid uh, to preach it. And yet I discovered the harder I made it, the more people wanted it, which was, and, and I found that with teenagers, 
that the harder you made it, the more they wanted to, the, the more they responded to it, which was like we something in us is innate, innate within us says, yes, that's got to be true. Uh, so uh, the whole cross idea, Jesus never, ever, ever uh, thought of himself. I mean, again, his miracles were never, he, 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 he healed people and said, don't tell anybody. Oh, come on, that's crazy. You don't do that. You, you, you build your Sunday night service on it. And miracle Sunday night. You know, you, you build your attendance on it. You attract people with it. And, and he, don't tell anybody. I just did this to help you, man. Uh, and all the way through, you get that. And of course, one of my favorite is he, he, he fed the 5,000 and didn't even take up an offering. You know, he could have charged a buck ahead and, or he could add a chain of restaurants, you know, across the country and been a millionaire. But it's not in his thinking. See, he doesn't think like that. Uh, so to, to, if you're going to have the heart of God, this, this is going to be the thought process you're going to have. And to, and to join his heart until this becomes instinctive within you, until you just, you don't make yourself do it. You don't have to second guess it. You just, it just, it's just the way you are. Yeah, it's beautiful. One of the things I love about uh, Philippians chapter two in that great kenosis passage yes. is as Paul's walking through that, one of the, one of my seminary prof professors was talking about that idea that when, when it says that he took upon himself the form of a servant, when you get into the Greek, the presumption is that it's not that he became a servant for, you know, 33 years and then finally dusted himself off and went, whew, I got to go back to being a king, but that the nature of God himself has always been a servant. And therefore, what he took upon himself was merely the outward fleshly mm -hmm. version of that which is what is that which he's always been, uh, which is really what you what you often talk about is the fact that, you know, he didn't just pop down and, you know, and did something for a couple of years to rush back into his uh, into the eternity of, of all the pleasures and benefits that he has. But really, that when you look at the life of Jesus, it was a constant pouring his life out. Never think about yourself. Roll up your sleeves, wash the feet of people. Uh, it's the bleed, suffer, die, live a cross. Yes, he died upon a cross, but he lived the cross. And then the challenge is he's calling each of us to that same lifestyle, which is the yeah. lifestyle of the cross. And the very incarnation is the heart of is the heart of the cross style. I mean, whoa, to leap off your throne and become a man and empty yourself of all the assets of being God. That that may be the real sacrifice more than a nail in the hand. Hmm. That's so good. So it's, it's amazing. That's beautiful. Uh, if I can give like a very lighthearted question, uh, I, I had asked several people on our in, on the Instagram uh, some questions for you uh, to see if I could stump you, uh, maybe. But one of the questions that came in, I it made me smile uh, because I, I I know you fairly well. Uh, you live a very healthy life as a whole. <clears throat> Uh, and there, of course, there's a lot of these great stories of, of your eating habits and your exercise stuff. But someone was just wanting to know, how, how do you stay healthy? Uh, what advice would you give to someone who's trying to get physically healthy? So maybe could you even just describe, uh, could you describe like, me like your running, like your, your simple workout that you've done for, you know, all basically your whole life? Uh, and then any thoughts for today? Well, it's interesting that... Uh... This, the health idea and the, uh, I don't I want to state this, the health idea and the practices of healthy living were all driven out of the spiritual life. Uh, it, it wasn't just a matter of being healthy. Uh, it was a matter of uh, 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 allowing what, what, what does Jesus want to do in my life uh, in relationship to the physical and how will that play itself out in the future? And uh, the, the being captured by his heart and wanting ministry, I, I didn't want to come. I wanted to be ministering at 65 uh, rather than playing shuffleboard. Uh, and to do that, you're going to have to have good health. So you have to set the basis of that. And, of course, I found myself becoming overweight at, age 40 uh and 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 the 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 dichotomy or or conflict of standing in the pulpit and preaching against beer and cigarettes 
and being 50 pounds overweight, somehow I couldn't tolerate that. <laughs> that didn't sit well inside. So I, I had to do something. And of course, being in, in evangelism, I couldn't afford uh, a, a different, every week, a different fitness center uh, and, and the time of that and, and teaching the kids and all of this. I had to just get up and do it, which running became the, the thing to do. And of course, you can't run if you don't stretch and do all the stuff. So you're okay in, in, in that, which did setups and, and all of that had to come into play to do that. Uh, so I, I got into that. There were years back then that I probably only missed maybe 10 days a, a year of, 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 of getting up and running five miles. And of course the weight fell off and, and, uh, and that's, and then the eating, uh, of course, if you really want to be healthy, you need to marry my wife, uh, cause she'll keep you straight. <laughs> I just do what she tells me. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and yeah, I'm, I don't, I cut out sugar. I don't eat any sugar. Well, and, and that isn't really true because fruit has sugar, but I'm talking about the refined sugar, anything. So desserts were gone. And now it's so much easier because you have all of this sugar-free stuff that's available. And there's all kinds of things that other people have, have demanded. Uh, so it's much easier now than it was. So those are, um, and I'm still doing that, but I'm not, I'm not able to do the five miles. I've cut back to three and a half and I can't do every day. My bones just won't take it. So, but I'm still okay. at it. I've been greatly uh, impressed. In fact, I was really rather convicted about six months ago by about that same thing about the, the physical reality connected to the spiritual. Uh, and so I've been slowly shifting uh, that direction. So maybe you know, give me, give me, give me about 10 more years. I might be as manly as you are. So, <laughs> and there is no right or wrong to it. Yeah. Every, every Hey, I have my genes and you have yours and there's no contest here. It's a, hey, what works for you may not work for me and, and vice versa. So you have to deal with your own physical body and, uh, and its response and there's no guarantees in all of it. Um, so it's, it's fun to be a part of. That's good. That's helpful. Uh, what is one thing that you love most about Jesus? Well, uh, you know, it would be easy to say, I love him because he did this and he forgave me and he did this and he did this and those blessings, but it's who he is, man. It's just uh, the captivating issue of Jesus is the person himself, uh, which I guess is the way love is in marriage or anything else. It's never what the in, uh, individual does for you, but it's who they are and that you've embraced them as a person. And uh, again, the fact of Jesus, that you never quite feel like, I never quite feel like uh, while there's a comfort, it's, it's the Sermon on the Mount, hungering and thirsting after righteousness and you'll be filled. Oh, good, I got it. But the minute you got it, there that in itself creates a hungering and a thirsting. So the very filling creates the hunger and thirsting. So you never quite feel like, hey, you've arrived in relationship with him, that you're always on the edge of uh, something brand new, uh, that this is stretching out. And, th and, th and that quality of his personhood, the hugeness of it, and an in investigation of the person uh, is such a, such a, vital part of the whole relationship. Mm, that's so good. Well, if, if I could ask one more question in the little time we have left, uh, and maybe it'd be like a two-part question. What, what advice would you give to someone who is studying the Bible for the very beginning? Like if someone's just saying, Hey, I really need to get into the word of God. Do you, do you have any advice for someone who is just getting into the word of God? And then maybe as a, maybe as even as, as a second question, what advice would you give to someone who is pondering getting into ministry? Well, uh, of course, we would advise them to saturate, obviously, and, and uh, it isn't, you, you cannot approach this thing as a, from an academic viewpoint. You, you, you've got to approach this thing as, uh, and, a, and of course, the way we've been expressing this is that uh, God said, I'm a holy God, 
And we looked at him and said, hey, that's fine. But I have no idea what that means. And he said, I'll write it down for you. And this book is the written voice of God stating who he is in his nature. So when you are filled with him and uh, he begins to aliven the word. So the key is the living word within and the written word without and literally yielding yourself to both of those that begins to shape your entire uh, life experience. Uh, so the written word without the living word is, is a waste of time. Uh, the guys at Wilson County Jail asked me, do you have a Bible I can understand? And I'd say, no, I don't. <laughs> if you're not filled with Jesus, you're because this is his lips parting and he's speaking to you. So when you view this as pillow talk at night with God, see, it, it changes it from just trying to get ideas or prepare sermons or Bible studies and gets into, I want to know what this thing says. And I've never understood that, frankly, in relationship to preaching. Uh, all I'm trying to do in preaching is to take this verse or paragraph and just here's, here's what Jesus is saying here. And just open it up, which we call exposing, expositional, uh, and allowing. So I'm, I'm just trying to find out what the thing says, because Jesus is speaking it. And I want to allow him to speak it into my heart and my life. Uh, so uh, the intimacy of oneness with Jesus begins to spill into the reality of his word. So that's really essential, I think. And for anybody who is going into ministry, uh, hey, come on, the first thing, the very first thing that's attacked by uh, any, any uh, demonic force is this word. It's the first thing the devil went after in Eve. God said, he said, ah, maybe he didn't. The very first thing you go after, the very first thing that happened to the Pharisees was a, 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 a overriding of the scriptures and a oral tradition that became more important, Jesus said to you, than the scriptures themselves. So this, this is the first thing to go. See, the, the only way you can adjust uh, into a liberal theology is to adjust this book and any, any ministry uh, that's going to be valid and going to experience the power of God has to come back to this, this book. So that would be my advice to stay in the word, man. Mm, that's powerful. Uh, Steve and I, I just deeply love and appreciate you more, more than I could even express. I think you too, uh, out, of, out of all the uh, people in this world, you've probably had the greatest impact on my spiritual life. I mean, I genuinely mean that. I think uh, prior to that summer, I traveled with you. Uh, Jesus was just a concept. It was just information. The Bible was just a book to study. But traveling with you and actually not just uh, hearing you talk to these things, but actually living them. I think, I think if nothing else, that was probably the most impactful thing that I've ever experienced in my life was just seeing you live just this reality of, of the word. And, and it just turned my world upside down. I remember, I think I remember coming up to you at the end of that summer, being a little frustrated, telling you that you've ruined my life because uh, I'll never be able to be the same way again. <laughs> you know, uh, And I haven't in the last, it's what has been 13, 14 years. Uh, my, I, I've been so deeply appreciative of just that time. And then just the years that we've had in ministry together. Uh, it's been such a rich blessing uh, just to see your faithfulness and your love for Jesus that just never grows cold. It just keeps getting more hot and passionate. And I just love it. So Appreciate you. Well, I appreciate you, brother. You probably have done uh, more for me than I have for you. So thank you. I don't think that's true, but uh, anyway. Well, love you dearly. Thanks for, uh, thanks for a little bit of the time this, oh, this what afternoon. A what a privilege. Thank you.